Nearly overnight, the entire world found itself adapting to a new way of working, carrying with it new advantages and challenges. Supporting a remote workforce, one with more freedom and flexibility than ever before, requires a new approach to support employees and customers, while at the same time keeping the business moving forward. To be successful in this new landscape, businesses must consider modern remote work tools, intelligent workspaces for the return to work, recruiting talent, and critical leadership traits. Cisco is shaping this path forward in delivering the employee and customer experience. Check out futureofwork.webex.com to learn more. There's a lot of great resources there like videos, articles, and a workplace maturity assessment tool. Again, that's futureofwork.webex.com. So really the rule of thumb here is very simple. When you lose the sense of common sense, it's quite often because you lose contact with the consumer or the customer, the really the people which are paying your salary, and you need to reconnect with the real world. And most companies today believe they're doing that through data. They believe that the spreadsheets and all these statistics and research studies are telling them the truth. But the reality is there's one little thing missing, and that thing is empathy. That is Martin Lindstrom, a New York Times best-selling author of seven books, including Biology, Small Data, and his upcoming book, The Ministry of Common Sense, How to Eliminate Bureaucratic Red Tape, Bad Excuses, and Corporate BS. The book was actually scheduled to come out this spring, but due to all of the craziness happening in the world, it has been postponed to January 2021. Martin is the founder and chairman of a Lindstrom company, a global branding and culture transformation firm working with Fortune 100 companies in more than 30 countries. He has advised organizations such as Lowe's, Pepsi, Burger King, and Google. Martin has been ranked on the Thinkers 50 list for three years in a row, and Time Magazine named him one of the world's 100 most influential people. Today we are talking about common sense, why companies have lost it, and how we can get it back. Martin shares the typical six roadblocks to common sense and how we can overcome them. He gives some great real-life examples of how he has helped companies tackle problems, and he shares his advice on how listeners can do the same in their organizations. You will also hear how Martin got a job at Lego at the age of 12. The issue is that today I would estimate around 40 to 45% of the work and the time you spend in your corporate life is to remove lack of common sense. It really is to navigate bureaucracy where you spend far too much time in meetings, far too much time navigating around the same issue in order to get stakeholders on board, far too much time producing an endless stream of PowerPoint presentations, right? Or even worse, far too much time in meeting rooms where the technology never works and where you're trying to plug in and plug out or conference call lines where the password is not working or you can't hear people, all that stuff. The world is changing quickly. What do you need to know and do in order to be successful now and in the future? From leadership to the future of work to employee experience, this show will give you the insights and the tools you need to succeed and thrive professionally and personally. Make sure to follow me on Spotify or subscribe to the show on your favorite platform. You can do so easily by going to futureofworkpodcast.com. Also, Please rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred platform is. It really helps spread the word about the show, and I personally appreciate it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Future of Work with Jacob Morgan. My guest today is Martin Lindstrom. He is a culture transformation expert and best-selling author of several books, including Biology, Small Data, and a brand new book, which I was fortunate to get an advanced reading copy of called The Ministry of Common Sense, which I love that title, by the way. So, Martin, thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you, and thank you for loving my title. It makes it, it, it means a lot to me, let me put it that way. Well, I love that the subtitle is How to Eliminate Bureaucratic Red Tape, Bad Excuses, and Corporate Bull... And then right over the end of it, there's the little red sticker that says Advanced Reading Copy. So it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't have the full curse word in there, which I thought was hilarious. 
Um, and Marshall Goldsmith wrote the foreword to your book. He actually wrote the foreword to uh, one of my books as well, and, and endorsed my most recent one. So we have a we have a Marshall Goldsmith connection. <laughs> yeah, listen, he's a little bit of a guru, I have to say. And and what's amazing about Marshall is his ability to understand human psychology in a very simple way. Um, and, and I think in many ways what I'm trying to do with the book is to do exactly the same. It is to put on a pair of really realistic and honest glasses and look, look at the world as it is right now and ask myself, why the heck is this happening in yeah. front of our eyes? How come there's so much red tape everywhere? So that's really the foundation for this whole thinking. Yep. Well, why don't you give us a little bit of background information about you and and how you got started with all of this? Uh, have you, Have you always been independent, or did you have was there a time in your life when you had a regular full time job working for somebody else? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you a funny story. Actually, when I was twelve years of age, I loved Lego, and um, so I decided to build up my Lego land in the backyard of my mom and dad's garden. Now, I was pretty serious. It took me about a year to establish this whole theme park of mine. And I'll never forget it. I opened the doors to this Lego land one day and only two people showed up, my mom and my dad. So I guess that was the lowest point of my career, right? So I went into panic, went down to a local print office and guys know how, but I actually persuaded them to sponsor my Legoland and put an ad in the paper. So guess what? Two days later, I had 131 visitors in my Legoland. Only problem was that the lawyers from Lego were number 130 and 131 and they literally came to sue me. And they said to me, the (laughs) lawyers from Lego actually came over to you? Yeah, they did. I was 12 years of age. I had my own Lego land. So they literally wanted to sue me back then. Now, this is a long time ago in 1982. And they did that with a smile, I have to say. And the deal was they said, hey, you probably can't use the word Lego. Um, But by the way, would you like to work for us? So I got a job at Lego at the age of 12, probably the youngest kid in history working for Lego. It's a little bit like the Willy Wonka chocolate factory story we're talking about here. Um, So I literally started to work for Lego in the R&D department. And later on, I started up my own company um, and sold it. So, yes, I've always been somewhat independent except my Lego story. I love that. So they, I guess, first question, how did they even find out about that you created this little Lego land? And it's actually a very so they I mean they were doing it obviously as as a joke to um you know to kind of encourage you to go there they weren't you know seriously suing a twelve year old but how did they find out that that you were even doing this? Well, they did find out because I, I did advertising and you have to remember oh my uh, god. <laughs> I'm, I'm born and raised in Denmark, and Lego is Danish, and yes. so it's only about 100 kilometers from where I was living. So when I put an ad in my local paper, they would see the ad as well, right? And the ad, as you know, as we talked about, was sponsored by the local print office. So it literally generated quite a lot of attention, the opening of my little Legoland, where I was charging $1 per person. So... Yeah, I know it's it's such a crazy story. People still today think, is that real? But yeah, I sure have the evidence for it. That is awesome. I love that story. Um, okay, so after, and actually I had uh, some folks from Lego on the, on the podcast a while ago. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of them. You know, my three-year-old is a fan of them. So shortly after that, you kind of went off on your own and you were just kind of one person or did you have some co-founders? Well, I did actually um, start up my own advertising agency straight after a couple of years later on. Lego was, by the way, my first client. Can you believe it? And and when I was 18 years of age, I sold my agency to BBDO, um, went with this advertising agency group for, for multiple years. And in 1997, I, um, I you know... I discovered something called the internet. In fact, I did that in 1994 when the World Wide Web was appearing. But in 1997, I was asked by BBDO to travel around the world to set up uh, the interactive units uh, worldwide. And that became BBDO Interactive and later on it merged into all sorts of different other names. So I worked a lot in the online space for multiple years. And in 2000, I basically decided to retire. 
And that's where I began writing books and realized, my God, life is boring when you're retired. So um, I was dragged back in again into reality. And that's where I started up Lindstrom Company, which really is where um, we're still working today and, and where we are helping uh, Fortune 100 brands around the world, companies to transform so they survive as technology and other good stuff is happening in our world. Why did you write this new book, uh, The Ministry of Common Sense? What what prompted that? Well, I, I have to be honest with you. When you work within innovation and with transformation, you quite often realize that uh, all the great ideas which are you know, popping out of ideation workshops and a lot of hard work in general, that they are dying very quickly. I'll give you an example. One client of ours, McDonald's, many years ago when Charlie Bell was the CEO, uh, asked us to reinvent the Happy Meal. And I said to them, yeah, I'd love to you know, reinvent the Happy Meal as long as I can make it healthy. So um, we created an objective for the reinvention of the Happy Meal. I wanted to make six years old become so happy about this Happy Meal they were willing to eat a broccoli. Um, and I think you know with a three-year-old at home how difficult it is to make a kid eat broccoli but that was the ultimate goal so we really started to redesign the entire happy meal around that philosophy and created this amazing concept where the uh, forest in the in the um in the you know the bushes in the forest would be a broccoli and the tomato will be the murder weapon and the cucumber will be um you no know, also different tools in this narrative and kids they absolutely loved it they thought it was amazing the parents loved it the franchisees loved it. So we rolled it out as a pilot across Europe. And then I went to uh, the headquarter, uh, which is outside Chicago, and, and pitched this thing. And the first thing they said to me was, it's interesting. Now, back then, I did not know what that meant, that word. So I thought, hey, they love this concept. And basically what happened after two years, they were ready to launch this new amazing Happy Meal. And guess what the Happy Meal was? Well, it was a conventional Happy Meal with all the usual suspects and an apple. And that was really the moment I realized. <laughs> an apple. <laughs> <laughs> apple. Yeah. So that's why I realized how innovation um, is killed. And so we started to hire a psychologist in our team to oversee processes and understand what's going on in a company. And that's where we realized, and this is around 15 years ago, we realized that every company had what I call an immune system. It really is a defense mechanism for change. And companies have it because as soon as they migrate from being a small startup company to become a real serious bureaucracy, uh, then what happens is that people are protecting what they already have. And through that, they create processes and compliance and rules and guidelines. And all of that becomes almost an invisible stretch jacket, which is almost sucking the ex oxygen out of the room in terms of innovation and transformation. So a lot of my work went down the path of understanding the immune system. And through that, it was pretty evident that we're now starting to see um, all this lack of common sense. And it really became very evident for me when I was um, working for a major bank, um, one of these 100,000 people plus banks. And I was sitting with this lovely lady um, and it was a workshop we were running overnight and at two o'clock in the morning through this workshop program, she stood up and she said, I'm sick and tired of all this stuff. There's so much crap in this bank. And I said to her, so what do you intend to do? She said, listen, we're going to fix this. I want to reinstall common sense. So what she did was she came up with this brilliant idea. She said, do you know what? I want to set up a ministry and I want to call it the Ministry of Common Sense. And that really not only became the title of my next book or my new book, it also became a real ministry inside this bank. And really, it's still running today. And every year they receive more than 1,000 inquiries from people across the entire bank 
telling her about the most stupid things happening. And this ministry had the ultimate power to change things, to remove rules, to reintroduce simpler format of compliance, to make life easier for the customer. And all that stuff is really what uh, has turned this bank around. And that's my point right now, that right now we are in a situation where there is no common sense in our world. And really my objective is to ensure that we can uh, recover again and get back to, to work. I, I love that bank story. Do you have an example of maybe like one of the things that somebody might submit to this Ministry of Common Sense? Yes, I, I have a ton of examples uh, of what they're submitting. I mean, one of the, the stupidities happening uh, in banks, I, and this is another bank, they actually had a, a rule which says that if you are sick, you have to call in uh, to the bank and warn them about this, but you have to do it 48 hours before you're sick. I'm not sure how that on earth is possible, but that's a classic example of some of these things happening. Wait, that was so, the actual rule? <laughs> it's the actual 40 rule. 48 hours before yeah. you're sick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I'll give you another example. One of the largest home um, do-it-yourself stores in the U.S., they actually have a rule that you are not allowed to swear. But actually, it's what's kind of funny is that when they have the professional arm where they deal with the whole development world, all the con uh, contractors and constructors, um, these people are swearing a lot. It's kind of their vocabulary. And so the sales reps in this particular company said to, to the senior management, listen, we can't avoid swearing. We have to swear with our clients because they swear. That's kind of how it works. So they created a new rule, which is you're allowed to swear when you talk to your clients, but when you talk internally, you're not allowed to swear. And, and it gives you a sense of all these stupidities happening a, across the world. And so what the Ministry of Common Sense did in the case of this bank was really to introduce a couple of simple guidelines. And one of them were, whenever you develop a new rule, you have to get rid of a rule. And this bank in particular had more than 18,000 rules. But well, the reality is that there's no way. It is insane. And you will notice that if you go through most banks, they probably are at that level. So when we started to do our research, we realized, well, listen, most banks, they never really get rid of rules. They don't have one rule coming in, one rule going out. So that was a new guideline established by the Ministry of Common Sense. And I remember I spoke to one lady which introduced this, this crazy rule, um, which were that uh, whenever you um, are using or a, 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 a buying coffee in the bank, they had free coffee, right? Whenever you use this free coffee and people are actually using too much coffee. Um, so she introduced a whole new guideline and, and she went to IT, had them reinstall this guideline on all the coffee machines. I mean, thousands of coffee machines. And really what it meant was that instead of you pressing once on this bottom, uh, you would not get a full cup. You now get a half cup because then they could save money. Right. Um, but what happened was that people, of course, re realized this. So they were pressing twice on the thing. So they would get too much coffee. In fact, they would get one third too much coffee and people would, would pour it out and then leave with their cups. And that rule, which were really embedded into the whole organization, it meant that actually they were losing more money than they ever done before. But because it was a rule, you couldn't really change it. So what we did was we went through all these different rules which were introduced and removed a lot of them after they've been running for some time. And it was interesting because I said to her, listen, how come you haven't removed these rules before? And she said, listen, I'm working in a function which are producing rules. If I remove my rules, I'm not productive. So I really can't do it. It's the first time ever I'm getting permission to actually remove my own rules when they're not working anymore. And really, it, it sounds super simple what I'm telling you right now, but that is the case, particularly in compliance-driven organizations, that they never really question where they are, why these rules are not working. They're just adding more rules on top of it. And I guess that's where bureaucracy is born. Yeah, that's insane. I mean, I... Um, I can very much relate to the coffee machine because I have a coffee machine where I have to push the button twice to get a full cup of coffee. <laughs> so I know exactly the frustration there. Um, yeah. Well, first question for you is wh why or where did all of this happen? Like, has this always been the case for businesses 
or did did something happen during the history of of business where we just started flooding rules and policies and bureaucracy uh, out of nowhere? Well, it's a really good question, and 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 the the answer is really coming back to entrepreneurship. The the issue is that when you are an entrepreneur, you see the world through a customer or consumer's eyes. You're not seeing it through a business person's eyes. And a good example, if you take Snap, uh, what was original was Snapchat. When they were founded, I'm sure you're familiar with the story of the two young founders. One of the guys was smoking weed and his friend was taking a photo of him and sent it online. And the day after, of course, the whole world fell apart. And he said to his friend, uh, I wish there was a technology which could delete those photos after a couple of hours so I wouldn't be haunted as I am. And that was the birth of Snap. Um, that is a person seeing the world through the eyes of a consumer. The same with Uber. Supposedly the, the founder of Uber back then was in Paris. He hailed a taxi. He went into the taxi and the taxi driver didn't want to go to the airport. And he was so furious, he said there must be another solution and that became Uber. The foundation for most entrepreneurs is to see the world for, through the eyes of a consumer because they are the consumer. And so the entire philosophy is growing around that, that point of view. And everyone will join in because they all feel that pain. But what happens over time is that um, you become afraid of losing what you already have. You're afraid of someone will steal the idea. You're afraid of some employee number 2,900 will certainly mess up your brand or your philosophy. So slowly they will create these, this safety net around it, which really is compliance, which is the rules and regulations and the conduct and all that stuff, which is introduced with good intentions, don't get me wrong, but over time it becomes almost the end goal. So suddenly the company is seeing the world from inside out rather from outside in. And that's where slowly the companies are drifting away from common sense where common sense becomes a whole new ecosystem inside the company where you kind of park common sense for a second and you start to create your own level of common sense. And so really the rule of thumb here is very simple. When you lose the sense of common sense, it's quite often because you lose contact with the consumer or the customer, the really the people which are paying your salary, and you need to reconnect with the real world. And most companies today believe they're doing that through data. They believe that the spreadsheets and all these statistics and research studies are telling them the truth. But the reality is there's one little thing missing, and that thing is empathy. It's the ability to put yourself in the shoes of another person and feel what that person is feeling. And as soon as that happens, it's almost like you're resetting the whole mindset. And that's where uh, common sense is coming back. In the book, you talk actually about, um, you look at a couple of different things that killed common sense. Uh, bad customer experience, politics, technology, meetings and PowerPoints, which I love that you included, rules, regulations and policies and compliance and legal. Um, so I thought maybe we could spend a minute talking about each one of these things, starting off with bad customer experience, because we've all experienced this. Uh, my wife, Blake Morgan, actually spends a lot of time writing about customer experience. So I've, you know, I hear all sorts of stories from her. Um, <laughs> yeah. So how did, how did this kill common sense? Well, bad customer experience is really where the customer is in one situation and the company is really not feeling that pain. So therefore, they're you know, acting in a in a different in a different way than what's expected from the customer's point of view. Now, I could give you multiple experiences. Let me give you one which I think is very telling. A couple of years ago, a, a very large organization in the UK was hiring us to redesign a whole ship, one of these cruise ships going around the world. Now, this organization is catering for people above the age of 70. Um, so it's for very senior people. Typically, the average age is 84 years of age on board on this ship. So anyway, uh, one morning I was um, inspecting the whole ship and the design principles of it. Um, and I was, I was furious because obviously they completely forgotten about who the audience were. So I went back to the headquarter, <coughs> teamed up with the senior management and realized most of them were you know, in the 40s men. And they really haven't 
put themselves in the shoes of the customer. So I explained it for them. They really didn't get it. It was very clear for me. So the day after, I said to them, hey, guys, I would like to meet all of you guys down at the pier at um, in the harbor where we have this huge cruise ship line, and I'd like you to check in for 24 hours. Now, I was lucky. They were listening to me, and the day after, at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I'll never forget this. This is crazy. They were all standing there waiting to board this ship. But what I didn't know was that I, over the last 24 hours, arranged for space suits to, for them to wear. Literally the ones you wear if you are in a medical emergency situation or uh, perhaps if you're going up to another another planet. Very heavy gear. Um, and it's super heavy, heavy. If you've ever been wearing it, you will notice they have aluminum in the, in the feet so you can stay on ground because of the gravity. So I put this you know, suit on them. And yes, there was a lot of objections. I had these very thick gloves. I put earplugs in their ears. I had some glasses, which have extra thick, and uh, had them wear those glasses. And then we went up the ramp, and it was it was absolutely crazy because as we were standing in the lobby, there was an announcement from the captain saying, "Welcome on board." And of course, they couldn't really hear it. And I said, "Now you have to check into your rooms." And one guy, he was the CEO. <laughs> it was so funny. He went up the staircase, and he couldn't really lift his feet because it was too heavy for him. So he was stuck two steps up and couldn't get down again. The other guy, he went into the elevator, couldn't press the elevator button because his fingers were too thick. And and again, another one, he's trying to complain, but, but, but he couldn't see properly. And after about two hours, they were I'm pretty furious about the whole situation. I, I called them together and I said, hey guys, I know I'm oversaturating a little bit here, but the reality is this is how it feels like if you are 90 years old and your ship is not designed for it. People can't walk up of these staircases. They can't see the numbers in the elevator. They can't hear the announcement. There's so many issues with this ship that you're actually not seeing the, the, the world from a customer's point of view. You're seeing it from your own headquarter point of view when you're 40 years of age. And based on that, we really went back and redesigned the entire ship. And this is an example about how a company which is an expert in seeing the world from an old point of view, like this particular organization, in fact, had completely lost contact with reality. And I think this is really symptomatic for most companies that over time, you get used to it. You don't even think about it. And suddenly you lose that contact, which is so important. So I have so many questions for you. Um, so the first thing that popped into my mind is earlier you were talking about how you got asked by McDonald's to redesign a Happy Meal. Now you're talking about a cruise ship. Obviously, these are very different things, right? I mean, a, a Happy Meal versus a cruise ship. So I'm really interested in how do you go about solving problems? So when when clients come to you with these very different problems, whether it's a Happy Meal or a cruise ship, how do you start to think about it? What's your process? Because I think a lot of people listening to this podcast, they are frequently tasked with trying to solve problems, overcome challenges. So maybe if you can share a little bit about your framework that you use, maybe it's something they can apply. Absolutely. Listen, the first thing I do besides talking to stakeholders in the organization uh, is to map down the immune system. It is to understand you have an org chart, but what is your unofficial org chart? What is the unofficial reporting lines? And quite often what we do is to, with permission from everyone I want to stress, is to start monitoring the traffic flow between people. So how many people is using Snap or WhatsApp? How many people is, is using unofficial channels to communicate? And we look at the traffic flow. We're not actually per se looking at what people are writing, but we are looking at where do we have the most communication going on? And out of that, we quite often see a completely different picture. We're seeing a picture where it may be the CEO is in charge, but actually the CFO is the one running the show because that's where everyone is communicating to. Um, it may be that there is a bottleneck somewhere in the middle of the organization where everyone is just going to that person all the time to check everything. We can see this huge fat communication line going to that individual. So based on that, we now start to realize where are the real issues. The second thing we do is, and this is really unusual, we actually take people from the organization with us into the homes or into the offices of the customers or consumers. And we do that because we want them to feel what the consumer is feeling. And let me give you an example. Now I'm going to deduce a third industry here, right? But one of our large clients is one of the largest pharmaceutical clients uh, or companies in the world. And they are very large manufacturer of um, respiratory disease products. So 
we said to them a couple of years ago, hey, do you really understand your patients? And they're all, yeah, absolutely, we do understand our patients. And we said to them, if you understand your patients so well, do you feel empathy when you interact with them? Absolutely. At a score out of 10, probably eight or nine. Fantastic, we said. Join us out in the homes of the patients. And they started to come out to the homes and they realized the real situation if you are an asthma patient. I mean, in some cases, the entire configuration of the home will be different. It literally, people will be sitting in the middle and the chairs will be surrounding that person. The, 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 the tables will be around that person so the person can jump or fall across the home because the person can literally not breathe. And they're all shocked to learn it. And then what we did was to take them all back, the entire senior management, and we did an exercise with them. We switched off the lights. We were playing a tape of a person briefing, very heavy briefing, one of these briefings where you feel the person clearly cannot really get the, the, enough air through, a, through every brief. And then we gave everyone a straw, and we asked them to breathe through the straw, holding the fingers on the nose. And after around 30 seconds, half of the room gave up. And we switched on the light after a minute. Some of them were blue in the face. And we said to them, do you know what happened right now? This is how an asthma patient is feeling. And they were shocked because they never thought about this before. Why? Because they never had the sense of empathy. And empathy, and remember, is the ability to put yourself in the shoes of another person. And from that point of view, from that point of time, these people started to innovate having the patient in the mind because they felt it. It was not just a piece of theory. They felt that uncomfortable situation about, can I really survive this thing? And that meant that the whole innovation pipeline changed. People started to be more aligned. And of course, these bottlenecks we saw throughout the organization, we had a focus on them in particular, ensuring that they were participating in these empathy, empathy challenges because then they would be much more willing to change their behavior whenever people would go to them. So long story short, the rules of thumbs are very simple. You have to see the world and experience the world through a patient's eyes or a, a customer's eyes. And you may say to me, well, I get a lot of videos every day. I go to focus groups. Stop it. It's not helping you. You have to get your hands, hands dirty and get into the real world. And that's where the majority, and when I'm saying majority, is 99.9% .9 of companies around the world really have stopped the game. They're not spending time with customers anymore. They're simply too busy doing all the bureaucracy in the headquarters instead. I love those stories. And in fact, in my new book, The Future Leader, so I interviewed 140 CEOs and I asked them about the skills and mindsets for leaders over the next decade. Uh, and empathy actually was one of the things that came up quite a bit. So I, I love that you talk about it uh, because I think it's very, very relevant. Um, so what about people who are listening to this who are thinking, you know what, you know, I, I love Martin's stories and examples. I, I can't do that. Like, I can't uh, get all my employees and take them over to a customer. I'm just the mid-level manager or I'm just, uh, you know, maybe an individual contributor. Um, how can, or maybe they, they're saying, well, my customer is, the, is somebody inside the company, right? I mean, for HR, for example, a lot of HR's customers are different business units or business lines. So how can they take some of your ideas or concepts and maybe apply it in situations where, I don't know, maybe they don't have the resources or the access uh, or the tools at their disposal. Can they still do anything here? Absolutely. And, and I think the best way to explain how you can do it is to take you into a piece of psychology. Um, some years ago, there was a huge study done on where do you create the strongest degree of empathy with people you don't know. There's a multiple situations appearing. One of them were that if you're in a crisis and you have people around you which are sharing that crisis, um, then you suddenly create empathy with other people. But there's also another phenomenon which is just in front of our eyes, which we never think about, and that is campfires. Yeah. Um, have you ever been to a campfire? And if you have, I'm pretty sure you, you agree with me. You have this sense of belonging. You have a coziness. You have a kind of a trust. It's kind of a, a very unique feeling sitting in the forest with people which you may not know and just talk about life. Yep. I've now, definitely been to campfires. Yeah, exactly. And if, if you try that, you will also know that it gives you a sense of honesty. Now, we took that whole idea. And by the way, what I say right now is, backed up by science because multiple experiments are showing that that's actually one of the highest degree of empathy you can create 
and with strangers is through a, a campfire experience. So we took the campfire idea and we basically said, how do we introduce a campfire into an office? And we did that every Friday afternoon with Lowe's, one of our clients. And we basically said to them, Friday afternoon, you guys have to come into um, the main room. There would be about 20 or 30 people in each office section. Um, we had a projector projecting a video of a campfire on the wall. We had a, a speaker on the, on the floor playing the sound of this crackling thing, you know, when you are listening to this campfire. We had a light in the middle of the floor, and then we asked everyone to sit down in one round circle, uh, and we switched off the light. And then we had people telling about the frustrations. And then at first there would be some people <clears throat> be very polite, and then another person, because you can't really see each other, tell a little bit more a, a true story about what's really going on. And after 10 minutes, you will notice people are really starting to tell the truth about how frustrated they are. And what happens very quickly is you'll notice these frustrations are pointing towards one direction, which is lack of common sense. People are sick and tired about whatever warnings, restrictions, guidelines which have been created, people not thinking on their own, and you will write it down. And what will happen is this will be the first step towards people opening up and removing this stretch jacket because here's really the issue. The issue is that today I would estimate around 40 to 45 percent of the work and the time you spend in your corporate life is to remove lack of common sense. It really is to navigate bureaucracy where you spend far too much time in meetings, far too much time navigating around the same issue in order to get stakeholders on board, far too much time producing an endless stream of PowerPoint presentations, right? Or even worse, far too much time in meeting rooms where the technology never works and where you're trying to plug in and plug out or conference call lines where the password is not working or you can't hear people, all that stuff. So what we ask people to do is to write it down. And then the second exercise is super simple as well. We ask people to take photos of the most frustrating moment they have over one week. Now, then people will take all these photos and we will attach a comment to each of them. We'll print them and we'll hang them in the room. And you will very quickly realize you'll go into a room with 500 frustrations hanging on the wall, which is crazy. And I've been into this room so many times and I'm stunned by the amount of complexity which is happening and all the stupidity happening in the organizations. And then we categorize it. We basically say, which one of these lack of common sense are basically just so frustrating, but which can be solved immediately? We typically will put it into three or four different pockets. But here comes the third thing, which is really clever. We do never say to people, let's set up a steering committee and let's work on this for the next two years. Instead, we say, first of all, we create 90 day interventions, short, very intense processes which are going to fix this issue. The second thing we do is we say, let's initiate a project which on one hand, both is solving the frustration, on the other hand, is earning money at the same time. And that's actually possible to do. Uh, you just need to think about this from a creative point of view. So I'll give you an example from the car industry. So again, one of our car clients many years ago uh, in Japan were really frustrated about the amount of energy they were using. And they wanted to save money across the company. And one of the ways they did that was to switch off the air conditioning systems during the summer period. And it was really causing a lot of frustrations among employees. I mean, thousands of employees. So one day we had this campfire idea and one person came up with an idea. He basically said, listen, if you go into our huge construction halls where we have thousands of robots working, have you guys noticed one issue here? And everyone looked at each other. They had no idea. He said, the light is on, but there's only robots in there. Why don't we just switch off the lights when the robots are working? And they did that and they saved millions of dollars based on a simple idea. So they basically solved two, actually three problems at the same time, saved money. They saved the environment at the same time and they made common sense thrive through the organization. And that's my third point. You will actually notice you are able to earn money by introducing a different set of common sense. And what we do is we take 50% of those money you earn and put it back to the division so they are motivated by continuing this process themselves. And we take 50% of that and we use it to innovate and remove lack of common sense elsewhere. And that means you suddenly have this ongoing process 
going through the entire organization and slowly starting to clean up things. So this is not a matter about saving money necessarily. It's about saving money or earning money and at the same time remove the lack of common sense. I love these stories. You have so many wonderful stories from these organizations you've worked with. Running a hybrid workforce of both remote and in-office employees requires a new approach. To be successful in this new landscape, businesses must consider modern remote work tools, intelligent workspaces for the safe return to the office, and critical leadership traits. Cisco is shaping this path forward. Visit futureofwork.webex.com to learn more and get access to lots of great resources like videos, articles, and a workplace maturity assessment tool. So, I mean, we've only just talked about bad customer experience. You have so many other um, roadblocks that, that kill common sense. Maybe we can talk about them briefly. Politics, I know, is a huge one inside of organizations. Um, do you have maybe a, a sentence or two that you can explain about that and any advice how to overcome that, if any? Well, politics, remember, it comes down to an issue about me not, again, seeing the world from another person's point of view. So I have no interest in, in dealing with other people's issues. And there's two issues here. First of all, I don't feel what other people in other divisions are feeling, so I really don't care. And the second thing is the KPIs, the key performance indicators, are not aligned. And, and that's a huge problem today because increasingly, because we want to report to Wall Street, we want to be very transparent. Each division and each function have different KPIs and they're not necessarily aligned. And I want to tell you a very quick story just to give you a sense of how bad this can be. So one of our clients is another client, it's Maersk, which is the largest shipping company in the world. They sit on 21% of all trade in the world. They asked us to fix up their whole customer journey worldwide. And we went to China and we listened into all these call center requests coming in and, and realized that thousands of these requests, funny enough, were complaints. And not only that, they were complaints and they were all categorized as force majeure. We all know force majeure is when something dramatic happens, like the COVID-19 issue or like uh, an earthquake. And, but really, thousands of issues every day, it didn't make sense. So I was sitting there listening into the call center with an interpreter and, and realized that when the request, the complaint came in, the person would click force majeure because it will only be one screen you had to fill out. But if you're taking any other reason for this complaint, you'll have to fill out multiple screens and it will take a lot of time. And when I went back to the KPIs, time was really the essence because the customer service department was measured on time, how quickly they could turn around a call. It was not measured on NPS, net promoter score or customer satisfaction. And what we realized was there was a disconnect between each of the different divisions not having the same KPI. So a key factor to generate politics is when your agendas are not aligned, when the KPIs are not aligned, and when you don't feel a sense of empathy for people working in other departments which have another goal, which doesn't happen to match up with yours. That's hilarious. So basically, they were all putting force majeure because it was it was the easiest thing to do and it saved them the yeah. most amount of time. Exactly. <laughs> <That> <laughs> it just sells it all, doesn't it? Uh, okay, let's talk about the technology. Well, technology is, is wonderful, except that I'm pretty sure that most people also feel a huge degree of frustrations around it. And, and there's multiple issues with technology, which I think is frustrating the world. First of all, it's all the technical problems you have every day. I mean, just yesterday I tried that I had to start up my new uh, Dell laptop, right? And my password did not work for some reason. And then it says, would you like to recover your password? I clicked it and it said, your laptop is not online, so we can't recover it. So tell me, how can I enter my new laptop when it's not online and I can't go online because I can't use my password? And so, so it's a catch-22 we're talking about here. Technology issues is everywhere, whether your printer is not working, whether that Skype call is not functioning, whether that conference call line, everyone is on the wrong time zone or whatever it is. And it's actually getting worse. And you know, recent statistics are showing that perhaps around 15% of the time we spend today is due to technology issues, if not even more. And we actually have become less productive because of this, not more productive, because we spend more time trying to align ourselves through technology. And there's also another factor. We're actually becoming less productive because the time we actually normally would have to reflect on lives, 
we use on social media. And that means that buffer where we typically would have time uh, to reflect and jump into a helicopter and see the world from a different point of view is just gone. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I personally don't have a phone anymore. And I'm not kidding. I really don't have a phone. Wait, 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 because... wait, wait, wait. we got to talk about this. You're, you're going to be scaring people here. So you don't have a phone of any kind? No, I don't have a phone of any kind. Not a and, cell and phone? Have, not a landline? Not a, not a landline. I do not have a phone. And I actually skipped the phone um, because of three reasons. And that was about two years ago I did it. First, we're never present anymore. Now, how often haven't you tried to talk to a person he's nodding and nodding and nodding and you just know he never heard a word of what you're saying? Uh, how often haven't you tried Did you go to a bar? And you're waiting for someone to show up. And guess what? The person is late. So what's the first, first thing you do? You grab your phone and you do anything with the phone so you don't look like a loser. So the, the, the fact here is that we're petrified of being alone. The second thing is we don't see things anymore. We don't see those seemingly insignificant details in our life which actually have a profound impact on us. And the third thing is really the worst thing. We never get bored anymore. And boredom is the foundation for creativity. It's that moment where we can reflect and connect dots in ways we normally have time for not doing. And, and that's the reason why I skipped the phone some years ago, because I realized my ability to do exactly that was starting to disappear. Hello. And I think that's an issue we are feeling and seeing in the world. And by the way, that's also another format of technology. Now, I'm not saying to everyone listening to this, skip your phone. I know it's really hard to do. But I'm saying you need to have discipline using your phone because the phone, to some extent, is a tool. And after that, it becomes a weapon against yeah. yourself. Yep. And I love that you mentioned being bored because uh, so I'm, I'm very much like addicted to chess. So, you know, I, I, and people who've listened to this podcast or have seen any of my content know that I talk about chess a lot. It's in my books. It's in my talks. It's everywhere. And so whenever I get a lot of free time, I'm very tempted to, you know, try to do like chess puzzles on my phone. And my wife actually says, she's like, Jacob, just sit here and be bored with me. Like she will, she will actually use that phrase uh, because you're right. I mean, if I'm like waiting in line for something, you know, I, I, I do chess puzzles. If I'm, uh, you know, I have time to kill, I'm doing chess puzzles. Like I, I'm constantly just doing that. And, and a lot of the times my wife has to bring me back and just say, you know what? It's okay to be bored. And, and you know, sometimes I have to remind her of that too. But you're right. We, it, it's sort I, of like, I like your wife. You know, yeah. It seems like she and I are very much in the same path. Do you know what? She's absolutely right. And, and now just to give you a, a technology analogy here, um, we all talk about you want to defragment the computer. And we all know defragmentation basically means it's restoring all the data in a more structured way. Well, defragmentating in, in a human way is either dreaming uh, or it is when we're alive to reflect. Uh, in the old days, we would reflect when we're sitting in a car because we couldn't be on the phone. We were not in contact no. with anyone. But suddenly that space was occupied. In the old days, it would be when we're standing in line in an airport. Well, that space is gone now. In the old days, it would be when we're waiting for the bus. Well, that's gone. So the defragmentation during the daytime is disappearing. Instead, we are on a constant uh, hunt to tick boxes in our to-do list and to reflect back on emails. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of more giving more, you know, producing more. One of the studies we did recently for the, for the new book was really showing that the more emails you send, the more you get back. There's actually a direct correlation between those two factors. So we produce all this content, but it never allows us to reflect on things and connect the dots. You as a manager or a CEO or a senior person in the organization, your role is not necessary just to connect dots or to tick boxes. It is to connect the dots. It is to jump into that helicopter and see the world in a perspective because no one else in the organization has time to do that. So that's your role. But with the smartphone and other devices and technology taking over, we don't allow ourselves that space because being bored is being a loser in yeah. our society today. And I think a good example of that is in one, common, in one company, and this is, again, lack of common sense. In one company, um, they literally, we realized when we did our research that all calendars were packed. These Outlook calendars were packed, and everyone could type into each other's calendar and book meetings and stuff like that. And then I realized 
when I went to the offices, people had a second calendar, one in paper. I said, why do you have a second one? He said, well, listen, the first calendar is the one which we show to the world. That's how busy I am. And then I have my real calendar where I really book my own meetings as I want them to be. And I have space for myself. And that's literally in one of the largest organizations on this planet, which literally are working with two calendars because having a busy calendar shows to the world how popular I am. And the other one is really the real time I'm using. Yeah. Not that I'm not busy, but I allow time for myself, but I can't say that to the world. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, I've, uh, I've had to take a lot of steps for myself. You know, like I try not to have any meetings on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I don't have any email or social media notifications on my phone. Like I'm... I'm not trying to be busy. Uh, you know, I don't want to have a lot of people complain about inbox zero, for example. Like, I have no problem getting rid of all of my email every day because I have a team I work with and I, I let them handle a lot of things that, that come up. Um, so I agree. I mean, being busy and showing the world how busy you are, it's that's not a cool thing. That's that's a problem. That's not like something that we should be trying to do. Yeah, but, but and you are so right about that. The issue is, what do we then do as human beings? And I think the issue is today's become the currency of popularity. That is, the more busy I am, the better I am. I mean, I cannot count the number of times I've been standing in an elevator and people are saying to each other, how are you doing? I'm surviving. Or, how are you doing? I'm hanging in there. These are the comments we have. I'm so busy is the typical next sentence coming out of people's mouth because we are seen as popular, but but I'll, I'll tell you about an experiment I'm talking about in the book, which is the anti-business experiment. We really ask people for a year not to reflect back and say how busy I am and not use any sentences whatsoever to talk about how busy you were. And the study really showed that the less you talk about it, the less busy you become. Because talking about how busy you are makes you feel very busy and that just makes you become more stressed. Yeah. But if you don't talk about it, you're actually less busy. And so I think where we are in the world is that we need to change that currency. And one of the reasons why I wrote the Minister of Common Sense was really to say to the world, do you know what? What we're doing right now is just not common sense anymore. It's, it's holy baloney quite often. And we need to pause for a second now and ask ourselves, is this really worth it? Or do we need to get rid of all this red tape because it's just not fun to go to work anymore? Yeah, no, totally agree. Uh, well, the next one you have, I oh man, a lot of people can relate to this one is meetings and PowerPoints. Uh, and, and a lot of times we have meetings to talk about meetings. Uh, so what? how is this killing common sense? It's killing common sense because there's multiple agendas going on. I mean, if I just put the technology aspects aside, there's this whole aspect around people saying something for the sake of saying something. No agendas in the meeting rooms. Or guess what? We all set one hour aside for a meeting. So for some miraculous reason, the meeting lasts for one hour and 10 minutes. It's very rare you have 20 minute meetings because well, you can't be productive in 20 minutes. But what I realized is you actually can change things quite a lot. Now, first of all, what's the issues? Point number one issue is everyone has multiple agendas. Everyone want to be heard in different ways in order to position themselves. I've tried quite often in these meetings as well that people are on the phones, on the computers at the same time, and they're all sitting nodding, but the reality is that they're preparing for the next meeting. Um, so they're sitting there with all their PowerPoint decks, preparing it for this really important meeting happening in two hours, and they're basically just not present in the first meeting. So we are sitting with people in meetings which are not in meetings, if it makes sense. And then you have all the technology coming on top of it where we can't get online, we can't connect things. And by the way, where we take people through these endless decks, I, I tend to say one of the, the chapters in my book is how big is your deck? Yeah. Because it really comes down to <laughs> the size of the deck, right? Now, I have a 262-slide deck with amazing graphs and statistics, and people are just saying, my God, she's really prepared. That's pretty amazing. My deck is only 15 slides. That's pretty embarrassing. So we pump up this stuff, and suddenly the goal is no longer to fix the problem. It's more to show off somehow. So, so one of the things I'm talking a lot about in the book is how to change that culture. And one of them is you need to have a clock ticking in the room. And the clock is really set based on what the cost is of running this meeting. I think we forget it. Quite often a meeting would cost twenty or $30,000 an hour to run. So why don't you put up a money clock, which is counting down? 
And then second, why don't you run the meeting in 20 minutes instead? And third, uh, why don't you have a person whose only role is to stop people when they go back and revisit the same problem that just did 10 minutes ago because they want to push their agendas? So there's a person with a red card. So there's different structures I'm introducing in the book which will help you to optimize meetings because as you say rightly so, meetings are now becoming meetings for the sake of meetings, producing more meetings, and, and we're not getting really anywhere. So it's a huge problem because yeah. what happens in the end of the day is that we're all stuck in these meetings. And if I look at a daily life of a person, today we know an average person is receiving between 350 and 400 emails a day. If you just use one minute per email, that's more than five hours. And then we also know we're spending an average three and a half to four hours of meetings every day. Now, guess what? At this stage, we haven't done any work at all. We're still sitting in meetings, right? So how can we be productive? And that's where frustrations comes in. That's where people really are worn, worn down and are giving up, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's great. I didn't actually even know those statistics. And yeah, I mean, that's more than eight hours, just emails and meetings, and then your day's done. <laughs> so... Um, yes, you know, the, the, most people are starting to do the work on Saturdays now, which is becoming sort of a work day. They're doing it after hours. And when we went through the whole COVID-19 crisis, you know, the, the whole world messed up private and work in one big blur where a lot of people I'm talking to with now is expected to go to work at, a, at, at 11 o'clock in the night because they don't have these routines anymore. So now everything is one big blur. It's not a healthy. We need to separate these things because else we, we basically are burning our candles in both ends. Yep. Uh, the next one, rules, regulations, and policies, which I think, uh, well, the last two that you talk about are rules, regulations, and policies, and compliance and legal, which you know I think everybody can relate to those. But maybe we could just spend one or two minutes on those. Yeah, absolutely. So rules and regulations are they're super tricky because no one would, li would like to see no to legal or to compliance. And they become almost like these functioning rooms where in, in offices or in companies where they become, don't get me wrong, but kind of guard. Um, if they say it, I guess that's how it is. Yep. Um, we actually spent time with a company the other day, uh, which is again in the pharma industry, uh, where compliance is incredibly powerful because they are here to protect the patients and make sure this company is not burning the fingers. But what we did was we said to the teams, the compliance teams, hey, you guys, you have forgotten who your customer is. And I said to them, who is your customer? Well, our customer is really re regulatory businesses. I said, no, it's not. Your customer is the patients. If you produce an amazing piece of work and it makes the patients happy and it's safe, then you've done your job. It's not the regulatory issues necessarily. And that was a huge change in their mindset. And then what we did was we redid the entire process together with compliance and made them become a service function within the organization. And by service function, I'm not saying that they will say yes to everything or they'll please everyone, but we basically said, your role is not just to say no for the sake of saying no. So we basically redesign compliance, which I know is super tricky to do, but it really helps. What I'm saying here is when legal and compliance and other functions get this much power, it really can destroy um, a company and how it evolves. You have to find the right balance and treat them as were their service function and make sure that of course they tick all the right boxes in order to stay safe or healthy, but they also start to be service minded within the organization. And once you do that, you will notice that the numbers of rules being established, the guidelines and the principles and the conduct and all this stuff being established is starting to be more sensible. And I, I wanna give you one example of conduct. If you take NBC, NBC when they had the Matt Lara crisis, you know, the former anchor of the Today Show, when he had this sexual harassment claim, NBC immediately placed the HR office on the main floor of the editorial floor so people could see it. Now, that sounds pretty clever at first. They wanted to be present, but I don't need to tell you, if you want to do a sexual harassment claim, uh, would you really go into this office which is in the middle of the editorial floor where everyone can see you walked in there and five minutes later a whole new rule comes out? Not really. And then they, not even that, they introduced another rule which is the hock and the release rule. It is where you're hocking people and release within one or two seconds. Now, no one is hocking that way. 
And so they create these things with good intentions, but the problem is it's detached from reality. And, and I think that reality check needs to become part of compliance and part of the rule setting and the legal. And today it's not. It's become such a holy grave that you don't even dare to question it anymore. Yeah. No, I couldn't couldn't agree more. Uh, and you're right. I mean, a lot of people do view compliance in legal as, uh, you know, you can't argue with them. You can't disappoint them. They kind of set the rules. Um, so maybe for people listening who are in compliance and legal, I suppose it goes back to your concept of, of empathy and just being grounded in reality before you start to, you know, push these policies and rules and make them something that everybody needs to follow. Absolutely. And I, I think that, you know, what's interesting when we work with people from legal and compliance and we do that every day, we engage them in innovation processes today. Now, it sounds crazy what I'm telling you, but I, I, let me give you an example. So for Nestle in, in, in India, we were involved in developing whole new lines of food. And there is a rule in India, it's a government in India would have set this rule that you are as a CFO personal liable for any lawsuits. So if there's a lawsuit going against a company, you actually are liable yourself with your own money. So I don't need to tell you that CFO and legal are really, really sensitive to any new innovation. So that's the reason why they had huge problems innovating in India, because no one dared to step out uh, and, and, and do courageous things. So we engaged them in the innovation process, and they actually were part of innovating great new products. And what was fantastic about this was that as they did that, they saw the world from the consumer's point of view. And in fact, they bought into the Kool-Aid. They were drinking of the Kool-Aid and started to get a more reasonable view of the world rather than just saying no for the sake of saying no. And as a consequence of this, Nestle in India really became super innovative. But they never they were never sued, by the way. And the legal functions and the CFO became very comfortable about you know, stepping outside the comfort comfort zone. So what I'm saying here is not a matter about them and us. It's a matter about engaging the functions. And quite often, they're not seen as people you want to engage in innovation. But quite often, I have to say, some of the most innovative ideas I've seen, I'm not kidding you, is actually from the finance and the legal functions. Wow. All right. Well, there you go. So a nice little plug for people in finance and legal and, uh, and compliance. Um, exactly. I, I know we only have a couple minutes left, and we didn't even talk about some of the solutions that you propose in your book. Um, I think you provide five steps for kind of getting to that common sense. Um, I don't know if you can maybe just give a sentence about each one, but it would be great for people to understand. So we talked about what some of these barriers are, and I'm sure a lot of people listening to this are kind of nodding their heads going, yes, that makes sense. How do we start to bring common sense back? Um, what steps can people be taking? I think the most important thing you can do is to acknowledge there is a problem. And I think you acknowledge that by talking to other people. So if I should go back to some of the hints I've given you before, the first thing I would do is, first of all, to acknowledge there is an issue. Number two, to map down what the issues are. And the best way you can do that is to look around in your office every day, take photos and map this down. The, th the third thing is then to categorize it. The fourth thing is to create a whole new business model around it. So you actually are both earning money while you're fixing the problem at the same time. And the fifth issue I would suggest is really to celebrate this whole thing internally. And now this sounds crazy, but, but let me just give you an example um, from a completely different industry or world. And um, some years ago, we were part of doing experiments with chickens. It was for science. Uh, yeah, I, science. I read about that and, in the book. <laughs> you did. And, and, and really the idea was very simple. We had, chicken stocked in a cage for half a year. And one day we opened the gates to this beautiful green grass, the sun was shining, uh, the bird was singing, and the chickens went out. And guess what happened within 30 seconds? They went straight back in again, back to the cage. And we call that the chicken cage syndrome. And the chicken cage syndrome is really the idea of that we want to change, but we don't dare to change. Um, so. The question is, how do you make a change happening in an organization where we say we want to change, but really we're not changing? Well, I, I want to ask you that question. So imagine this. Imagine you are seeing four chicken cages from above, and they're stuck in the in a round circle, so they're all pointing towards a center, like there's a town square. Now, if I open all these chicken cages and I want the chickens to go out, and you have some corn, where would you place the corn 
in order to get the chickens out of those chicken cages. Okay, so they're all arranged in a circle. Yeah. And, okay, so obviously the most tempting thing, and I'm sure what most people say is you put the corn in the center, but I have a feeling yeah. that's not the correct answer. Um, so where would you put the corn? This, uh, is to, the chess, this is the chess player in action. I can feel it. Yeah, so to get the... I mean, would you put it just right in front of their each individual... Absolutely. you spot on. And the reason why I'm sure you all already gathered is because when I pick a corn straight out of my chicken cage, which is easy and safe to pick, first of all, it gives me a satisfaction. The second thing is I'll look at all the other chickens and they'll do the same so I feel safe. And that means if I place a next corn a little bit further into the center and a next corn, a next corn, I'm slowly being dragged out of the chicken cage, but I feel safe at the same time. That little piece of corn just outside your chicken cage, I call a 90-day intervention. These are short-lived, very quick changes you make in the organization. And what you do is whenever it succeeds, you are celebrating that throughout the organization. And the celebration is really important because if you celebrate when picking up the first corn, all the other chickens are looking around and they feel, wow, I want to feel that too. And it kind of justifies or verifies or at least in somehow tells the world this is the right thing and it changes the culture as a consequence of that. And if you continue having these small wins, time after time, certainly it solidified the fact that we are on the right path and that's where you have a transformation of a culture happening. So really what I'm saying here is, it's super important for you not to have these long-term goals and talk about what's happening five years from now. Yes, the goal is fine, but you have to break it down to small bite-sized things and celebrate it every time. And I think the key problem in organizations today is that companies are setting those small goals sometimes, but they're not celebrating the, the success of them, the victories. And that's just as important as fulfilling them. Hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's wonderful advice to, uh, to end on. Um, and the other thing I noticed is a lot of your solutions are not, I don't want to say extreme, but they're like, they're, they're unique, right? I mean, uh, how you redesign a Happy Meal, how you think about a cruise ship and getting people to wear spacesuits. Like they're, I guess you could say they're, it's required to have a little bit of out of the box thinking, a little bit of storytelling, a little bit of creating experiences in there as opposed to just kind of telling people the information. So maybe whenever possible is get people to experience it, use stories and try to think a little bit creatively because uh, it sounds like you do a lot of that. Uh, absolutely. Listen, let's be realistic. The only thing which has been around on planet Earth for thousands of years is religion. And religion was and still is intact to some extent because you have a Bible or you have a Quran or you have some holy write-up which have been transported from generation to generation using storytelling. And storytelling still sticks to our mind and it still gives us to some extent a sense of purpose. And we need a purpose in the organizations and there's not a lot of purpose anymore because companies are busy earning money but they're not busy necessarily making us all smile. So storytelling is an incredible, powerful tool. And what I've learned is as soon as you put up a PowerPoint deck with millions of graphs and statistics, people tune out. It's almost like they get this urge to check their emails straight away. But if you tell an amazing story, it engages people. And through that engagement, you can create a movement. And at the end of the day, culture transformation is all about creating internal movements with people who believe in things. And I think we desperately need that in our world yeah. right now. So yes, you're right. You need to have a creative aspect to this to surprise people and to entertain people because we have no attention span anymore. And you know what I mean. I'm pretty sure if I could look through the screen right now and see what you're doing, you're checking your emails as I'm talking, right? I, uh, no, so, I, only, I only check email once a day at 4 o'clock, which, okay. which would be in 30 minutes. Okay. Oh, we're so close to it, right? So, <laughs> so the, the, the reality is that we have no attention span. And that means that you need to do something which is so engaging that people actually want to listen to you and they drop everything else they have in their hands. And I fundamentally believe you can only do that through creative thinking, as you call it, out of the box and through uh, amazing storytelling and using metaphors in particular. And I'm talking a lot about how to use metaphors in the way you do and run leaderships in organizations because that's the way you engage people to believe and change and move on. Yeah. Well, I, I, I love your stories. I, I love your advice. I mean, we even went over the hour a little bit. Um, and 
for people that want to learn more, I mean, that's why they should grab uh, your book, The Ministry of Common Sense. But where, where can people go to learn more about you, some of the stuff that you talk about? I mean, anything that you want to share for people to check out, please feel free to do so. Well, thank you. Listen, you can find me everywhere almost. So you just go into martinlindstrom.com, which is my site, of course. But you can also check me out on LinkedIn, which is Lindstrom Company. Or you can go to um, all sorts of different channels like Twitter or Snap or Instagram, uh, where I'm posting uh, new messages every day. So it's typically a new article every second day about what's going on in this world or about what's going on in companies and how you have to change it. So hopefully that can give you inspiration in, in addition, of course, to, to hopefully my book can, can provoke you enough to ask yourself if you want to set up ministry inside of Common Sense. Yeah, I mean, as they say, common sense is not that common. So I hope after yeah. uh, after listening to this and uh, reading your book, we'll be able to bring more more common sense back to organizations around the world. Me too. Uh, me too. Martin, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to speak with me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And next time, I hope we'll get a chance to meet in person, and I'll beat you in chess. I'm, yeah. okay. I'm just I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I did see on your Instagram you actually had a little uh, a chess. Um, one of your things was a little chess piece. So I was like, ah, I can tell him you like Martin. Ah, exactly. <laughs> well, th thanks again. I really appreciate it. And thank you everybody for tuning in. My guest this week, Martin Lindstrom, please make sure to go check out his new book, which I had a chance to read called The Ministry of Common Sense and bring back some common sense to your organization. I'll see you all next week. Thanks again for tuning into The Future of Work with Jacob Morgan. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please remember to follow me on Spotify, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, or your favorite platform at futureofworkpodcast.com. If you want to reach out to me about sponsoring the show, or if you just have feedback for me, please send me a note at jacob at thefutureorganization.com. <laughs>